All right, thank you again for uh, your kind patience. I know it's tight between breaks. Uh, we're ready for our third presenter, uh, the pastor at Zion Gwinner, Pastor Matt Richard. Well, thank you to Pastor Rosebro and Pastor Fisk for sharing thus far. And uh, I've been assigned, uh, Pastor Fisk said, I've been assigned cleanup duty. And so we're going to be looking at Christ alone or solus Christus. And uh, we're looking at these two simple words, Christ and the word alone. Now, when we say these two words, Christ alone, we're actually asserting two things. First, we're confessing Christ, and secondly, we are confessing Him alone. These two simple words are not simply a slick marketing slogan for the 16th century Reformation, but are at the core, they're at the core of what it means to be a Christian. After all, the word Christian technically means follower of Christ. Now, unfortunately, there are oppositions to the confession of Christ alone. For example, take the word Christ. There have always been attempts by the forces of darkness to eliminate the name and confession of Christ, as well as the seduction to idolatrize the name and confession of Christ. Furthermore, the word alone is also not free from attacks for prerequisites and codified responses will attempt to replace and undercut the word alone, which essentially negates the single-handed work of Christ. In our brief time together this evening, the two words of Christ and alone will be examined with one foot in our reformational theology and another foot in the challenges of the 21st century in other words, it is intended that you, the hearer, will understand these two simple words, yes, Christ and alone, these two simple words from their rich theological history, while simultaneously considering these two words in today's contemporary culture, a culture that I might add, that attempts to diminish, change, add to, and eliminate the confession of Christ alone. So as we begin this evening... Let us consider a hypothetical question. What would things look like if Satan, yes, Satan, took control of Grand Forks, North Dakota? And we'll throw East Grand Forks in there too. <laughs> Immediately, our minds, they drift to negative things such as mass chaos, anarchy, bloodshed, moral decay, outbreaks of painful infidelity, and so forth. Chaos breaks loose. However, is this how Satan, is this how Satan would work in here, here in Grand Forks? Is this how he would unleash his rule in our midst if he could? Let us consider our response a moment and reflect upon the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul describes Satan in his second letter to the church in Corinth. He says that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Considering this, it seems that Satan tends to work much more covertly. In reflecting on our hypothetical question once again, consider the following answer from a Presbyterian pastor named Donald Barnhouse. Some 50 years ago, he offered up a scenario on his weekly radio sermon that was broadcast nationwide on CBS. He speculated that if Satan took over a city, that all the bars would be closed Pornography would be banished, and pristine streets would be filled with tidy little pedestrians who smiled at each other. There would be no swearing. The children would say, yes, sir, and no, ma'am. And the churches would be full to capacity every single Sunday where Christ is not preached. My friends, it is easy to miss Christ, and measure how things are going based on our happiness and social surroundings. Keep in mind that the evil one is the great con artist who entices us to look away from Christ 
to ourselves saying things like this. You can save yourself, just try harder. You only have five more steps to go. The potential, it lies within you. Look at how wonderful things are. Oh my, oh my, you are blessed. You're one of those blessed people with moral integrity. You are not like those other people. Tragically, Satan has Christians in the world fighting the wrong fight of trying to to nurture our good qualities and then at the same time suppress and starve out these bad qualities with the purpose of meriting and gaining non-perishable eternal worth. He has everyone chasing a carrot on the end of a stick, leading us away from Christ, leading us away from Christ crucified to the jaws of hell. Simply put, Satan only needs to get the church to look away from Christ. Remember that a lot of things that distract us from Christ are not only negative, but can also be very good things. In the words of Michael Horton, in order to push us off point, all that Satan needs to do is throw several spiritual fads and moral and political crusades and other relevance operations into our field of vision, focusing the conversation on us, our desires, our needs, our feelings, experiences, activities, and aspirations. These all energize us. So what would things look like if Satan took over Grand Forks, North Dakota? Simply put, Christ not preached. It would look like Christless, Christless Christianity. The key issue for us tonight and this topic of Christ alone is Christ alone. Where Christ is clearly professed and presented as the Savior of sinners of you and me, we can be most assured that the forces of evil will be on site trying to turn the eyes of the church away from Christ. Now, if Christless Christianity is not possible, in other words, if the confession, this confession of Christ, is not successfully silenced, then Christ will be idolatrized. Yes, idolatry. In other words, if the bold confession of Christ is not eliminated by the face and in the face of tyranny and death, persecution and rejection, there's another tactic that we as Reformation Christians, will be faced with. This tactic is not the removal or the silencing of Christ, but the idolatrization, the idolatry of Christ. I'm reminded of the Apostle Peter's remarkable confession about Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter. We hear from Peter that Jesus is the Christ. (laughs) This is a bold confession. Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. However, in only a few short verses, Jesus goes on to explain exactly what that means, what it means for him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. In other words, Jesus explains that as as the Christ, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the scribes, and the chief priests, and be killed, and on the third day rise again. Peter, though, he had a tough time accepting this. Jesus' explanation was difficult to accept, especially that that dying and that suffering part. Thus, Peter, he rebuked Jesus. (laughs) He rebuked him. Peter was attempting to think about Jesus according to a man-centered way. Peter, he took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him, saying this, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen. It shall never happen to you. You see, what went wrong with Peter is what goes wrong with you and me and our culture. We subordinate. We we subordinate Christ. We subordinate Christ and how we think about him to our own opinions and our own desires. Yes, Peter, he subordinated the Christ, the Son of the living God, to his definition of Christ. Peter, he... He worked these words about Jesus being the Messiah his way to what worked for him. Peter would not let Jesus be Christ his way. Peter would lay on Jesus the sword of Christ he wanted him to be. My friends, this temptation to redefine Jesus is before each and every one of us. 
It is prevalent in the North American church and culture as well. If we were in Peter's shoes, we would have recoiled in horror to Jesus' talk of suffering and death as well. Like Peter, we would have said to ourselves, if Jesus is God's Christ, then let there be an end to this defeatist and this talk about suffering and death. Tragically, we Christians and the culture, we commandeer, yes, we commandeer this great confession, and then we redefine, we redefine who Christ is according to our hopes and our dreams and our desires. We do this because it is the way that it is with our idolat idolatrous hearts. It may be asserted here again that if the confession, that is that confession, that bold confession of Christ, if it cannot be eliminated and silenced, the person of Christ is idolatrized. That is what happens in a world that is hostile to Christ. It is what the sinful flesh does in reaction to Christ and his gospel. You see, any time any time that we entertain thoughts about God that are unworthy of him, we are actually breaking the first commandment and we're committing the sin of idolatry. In other words, idolatry is it's rather sneaky because it allows the opportunity to not totally reject it's just it's I mean it's brilliant to not totally reject the Lord, but an opportunity to simply redefine him according to our own desires. That is to say, we can add an, add an expansion pack of supposed divine ideologies upon the Lord and not necessarily have to reject the Lord. This allows us to have our cake and eat it too. This tactic, this tactic of not rejecting the Lord, but redefining him according to the man-made agendas is the result of the old Adam, this sinful nature at work, Keep in mind that the sinful nature, that is a corrupt, yes, a corrupt and evil nature that we have inherited from Adam and Eve, from their fall into sin, does not believe the gospel, never has believed the gospel, and never will believe the gospel. The old Adam operates from unbelief. The sinful nature wants independence, not dependence. The sinful nature wants to have everything, including the Lord, underneath his thumb. This freedom and this control can be cleverly attained through, yes, through the means of idolatry. To put it briefly, this old, sly, old Adam, yes, is sly, and he will not flatly reject the Christ and the gospel for the fear of being exposed. Rather, the old sinful nature will attempt to redefine Christ into his own image. When we, the North American church, and the culture, when we hijack and redefine Jesus according to our own definitions and our own agendas, we become, bluntly stated, the mouthpiece of Satan. This is surely what Peter did to Jesus by attempting to redefine the mission and the work and the person of Jesus. This is what you and I do when we take Jesus' words, his biblical truths about himself and his mission of the cross, and simply run with them according to our own schemes. Indeed, defining Christ according to our own man-made centered opinions, desires, hopes, and dreams, rather than letting Christ simply speak for himself through his word, is doing the work of Satan. Now please bear with me and my intensity for this, my friends. It, is, it, really, it really is no light matter. The person and work of Jesus is of utmost importance for you, for me, and for the Christian church. Who we say Jesus is is the most important assertion that can be made, for it reveals, it reveals not only who we believe Jesus is, but also dictates and defines how we understand the church, how we read the Bible, how we live, and how we understand truth. Our understanding of who Jesus is has lasting ramifications in this life and the next. So who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus according to the scriptures? Who is Jesus according to our Reformation theology? 
Who is Jesus according to the North American church? Who is Jesus according to our culture? Keep in mind, my friends, that Christ alone means that there is only one, only one genuine Christ. However, today's American culture offers many Christs who are not really Christ at all. Therefore, asserting solus Christus means that as Reformation Christians, we reject positions in opposition to the genuine Christ. With that said, let us have a little fun. Let's take a moment and examine 11 different false Christs that are prevalent in our church and culture today. 11 different Christs that attempt to redefine Jesus Christ. These are idolatrized Christs. The first, the first false Christ is Christ the mascot. Yes, the mascot. This false Christ does not merely stand on the sidelines, but is heard from pulpits across the land cheering for the old Adam, for the sinful nature. Because this mascot Christ encourages people to love themselves first and to gratify all sinful, fleshy desires, he only gives suggestions and not commandments. Indeed, instead of confronting the old sinful nature with the law unto repentance and death, this mascot Christ cheers on the old Adam to get to the second tier, climb a little higher, work a little harder, you can do it, onward and upward. He is all about serving mankind's will above God's will. He waters down the words to avoid offense. He overlooks sin and he never corrects. Christ the mascot, our first false Christ. The second false Christ is the Christ who is the option among many. This Christ among many is perfect for smorgasbord faiths because he is not exclusive. He is not the way, the truth, and the life, but simply a way, a truth, and a life. He sends all to heaven and dismisses hell. He promotes unity and tolerance at all costs. Because he is non-exclusive, this Christ among many is loved by the world and can get along with most any religions of the day. This false Jesus is like a spiritual guru, which means that he plays well with Buddhism, New Age theology, new neo-paganism, and so forth. Christ, the option among many, our second false Christ. The third false Christ is Christ, the example. This false Christ is often preached as a moral example whom we are to emulate the idea lying behind this view is that our sin is, is little more than a confusion and that we have within us the inner moral uh, endeavors to do whatever should be done once we are taught it. The gospel of this particular Christ is pure law, though few pastors who preach Christ as your model seem to recognize this fact. Christ the example, our third false Christ. The fourth false Christ is Christ the giver of bling. <clears throat> that is to say, this false Christ, he gives health and wealth and prosperity. He gives bling. This false America, Americanized prosperity Christ is the preaching of a Christ who always grants health and wealth to those whose faith in him reached the level it should those who have watched the Pentecostal televangelists on Trinity Broadcast Network recognize this Christ. He's all about the best life now and earthly treasures. Show me the money, this Christ yells. Christ, the giver of bling, our fourth false Christ. The fifth false Christ is Christ, your BFF. Yes, your BFF. As your best friend forever, this Christ is very personal, so personal that he lives deep down in your heart. This false Christ is separated from the word, that is to say the Bible, and whispers sentiments in that still small voice from the caverns of the heart. This false Christ exalts signs and wonders and mysticism above God's word and is always searching for that tingly and moving experiential feeling Christ, your BFF, our fifth false Christ. The sixth 
The sixth false Christ is Christ, your girlfriend. This false Christ is meek, mild, soft, and gentle with long feathered hair and a perfect complexion. He spends his time cuddling with little lambs and accentuates emotions. This false Christ is the reason for so many praise and worship love songs, touchy-feely sermons, and girly men pastors. I had fun writing that. <laughs> Furthermore, he exalts emotions, experiences, and opinions above sound teaching. A word of caution with this false Christ, never worship a Christ that you can beat up, for if you can beat up a namby-pamby savior, he is most likely a Christ, your girlfriend, the sixth false Christ. The seventh false Christ, <laughs> Christ the new Moses. This false Christ imagines that Christ is a new lawgiver and he has brought us new and improved laws. According to this false Christ, Moses' laws are a little bit dusty and outdated and old. However, this new Moses Christ, he brings new and improved laws. Moses' laws are 1.0, but this new Moses Christ's laws are 2.0. No gospel with the seventh false Christ, just more law. The eighth false Christ is Christ the Patriot. This one stung me. This false Christ is the Christ for the GOP Republican Party. He's against raising taxes, a promoter of capitalism, and belongs to the NRA. <laughs> <clears throat> he functions as an endorser of political strategies, political elections, and political persons. This false Christ is the political sanctifier of any campaign wanting the votes of the religious right. The false Christ, the patriot, our eighth false Christ. The ninth false Christ is Christ the rabbi. This false Christ is a good moral teacher, nothing more. Walking on water, healing the sick, raising the dead. These things are the creations of myths of old and not characteristic of Christ the rabbi. This false Christ is all about that which is physical. He is a materialized Christ who simply was a good teacher, but nothing more. Christ the rabbi, our ninth false Christ. Christ the psychotherapist is our tenth false Christ. This is an extremely popular position in today's evangelicalism. This Christ is preached as the one who can heal our inner psychological wounds from childhood. He can heal broken marriages, aid us in communicating with our children, and deal with other dysfunctional situations. Christ, the psychotherapist, our tenth false Christ. Finally, but not least, the eleventh false Christ is Christ, the precious moments edition. This Christ is a crossless Christ with no blood, no wounds, or suffering. He is like a precious moments Christ figurine. In other words, this false Christ has been sanitized from the messy blood and the scars and the spit and the crown of thorns. This Christ is rated G and is all about the resurrection with no mention of Golgotha. With this Christ, the resurrection is emphasized more than the cross Easter is highlighted more than Good Friday. He is without a cross and without nail-scarred hands, our 11th and final false Christ, the precious moments Christ. Take a little brief excursus at this point. It is necessary, it is necessary at this time to just take a step back and ponder this 11th false Christ. Many Christians, they regard Lutherans Yes, they regard Lutherans as being very one-sided or narrow in their theology. The accusation goes like this, that we Lutherans, that we shrink down the church year together into Church Friday. In other words, Lutherans are often blamed for making every day Good Friday while ignoring all the other major themes of the church year. We're accused of failing to move beyond the cross to the resurrection. A recent comment from a reader on my personal blog, uh, PM Notes, captures the concern well. She stated this, this a while back. She said, all too often you Lutherans 
focus exclusively on Christ's death and not near enough, if any, on his resurrection. The power of the gospel is that Christ rose from the dead. It's our future hope to rise as well. Herman Saza, in his book, We Confess, also addresses these criticisms towards Lutherans. He states that we are accused of only focusing on the cross, only one fact among others in the second article of the Apostles' Creed. It goes like this. What a constriction of Christian truth Luther has been guilty of. How can true Christian theology be limited to a theology of the cross as if there were not also the theology of the resurrection? So what shall our response be? Is the choice between the cross and the resurrection? Are we, are we faced with only two options, the cross and the rest of the Bible's doctrines? If so, should we fight for the cross at the expense of diminishing everything else in the Bible, the other doctrines? Or should we simply loosen up on our passion for the cross, Luther's theology of the cross? Thankfully, my friends, the choice is not between the cross and other biblical doctrines, for this would be what we would consider an either-or logical fallacy. The choice is not between two alternative doctrines as the only possibility. Saza responds to these apprehensions saying this, Obviously, the theology of the cross does not mean that for the theologian, the church year shrinks together into nothing but Good Friday. Rather, it means that Christmas Easter and Pentecost cannot be understood without Good Friday. Without Good Friday. He goes on to say it's always from the cross. It is always from the cross that everything is understood because hidden in the cross is the deepest essence of God's revelation. What this means, my friends, is this, that we don't avoid the theme of creation, the work of the Holy Spirit, the resurrection, and so forth, Rather, when we speak of these themes, we do so while seeing the cross in the background, and we do so with the shadow of the cross hanging over us. Otherwise stated, we embrace these biblical themes, preach them, and teach them while we understand them in the light of the cross, but never, I repeat, never apart, never apart from the cross. This is the end of the excursus. Back to our previous 11 examples of false Christ. <clears throat> it is apparent that there is much idolatry in these 11 examples. It is apparent that it is indeed very much saturated with idolatry. Indeed, when the person and work and nature of Christ are obscured, idolatry is present. With that said, though, there are several common things working within the different false Christs, these false Christ examples. In other words, there's something ident identifiable and definable in all of these 11 examples. What is identifiable and definable in each of these examples is the inherent diminishing of mankind's original sin. To rephrase this, when we fail to clearly see or when we underestimate the depravity of mankind, the person of Christ suffers. Indeed, not only does the old Adam want to put Christ into his debt, but the kind of Savior that is needed for mankind is dependent on the predicament that mankind is in. For example, if mankind is viewed as basically good with some bad habits, then a Christ who is crucified for sinners is not needed, but rather a patriotic Mascot BFF Jesus, who gives bling and acts like a girlfriend, could be handy to enhance the Christian life. Conversely, though, when we assess mankind in the light of Scripture, we come to see that mankind's nature is always much darker. It is much darker than we usually believe it to be. True, we must confess that mankind is created in the image of God, but we must not fail to recognize that Genesis 3 marred mankind in sin making us not mostly dead, but dead, dead. A mere mascot, example, bling giver, BFF, girlfriend, new Moses, patriot, rabbi, psychotherapist, and precious moments Jesus are not sufficient with this view of sinful mankind. Rather, an all-powerful, an all-knowing, an all-sufficient, bleeding, dying, rising Savior is needed to deliver mankind from sin, death, and the devil. As previously stated, this subject is of utmost importance for us right here and right now. 
The reason why? Hell, my friends, is just as happy with those who believe in a fake Jesus as with those who believe in no Jesus at all. There's no difference. A fake Jesus standing far off in the distance, cheering you and me on like a mascot while we attempt to enact our own spiritual powers towards man-made endeavors is really no Jesus at all, but a crossless Jesus. An Americanized Jesus who promises us promises us health and wealth and happiness, if only we do this or we do that, is really no Jesus at all, but a crossless and bloodless Christ. There's only one Christ. There's only one Jesus. The Jesus who would undergo great suffering, rejection, and be killed and rise again after three days. Yes, there's only one Jesus, but there's a world full of imitations, imitations created in the image of what we want Jesus to be. Now that we have defined and exposed all these false Christs in our culture and North American churches, it is of paramount importance that we take a moment to define who Christ actually is because we are confessing Christ, are we not, when we confess Christ alone? As we define who Christ is and what he did, we must do so while acknowledging that Jesus does not act according to our own sinful definitions of who we think he is. He is Lord and we are not. Our opinions Our hopes and our dreams of who we think Christ should be do not matter. He is not handcuffed to our religious undertakings and aspirations. Like the lion Aslan in C.S. Lewis's book, The the, The Chronicles of Narnia, the Lord is not tame or safe, but he is good. Indeed, he does not like being tied down by our definitions, our ambitions, and our desires, he must not be pressed, for he is not a tame cat, but a kingly lion. So looking back to the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, we see that Jesus did not yield to Peter's objections, but cast Peter's objections and the temptations of Satan off to the side, behind him, and he walked directly to Mount Calvary, and he considered it all well worthwhile. Therefore, on the basis of Scripture... On the basis of Scripture, we confess that Jesus Christ is true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary. He is our Lord who has redeemed us, lost and condemned persons. He purchased and won us from all sins, from death and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy and precious blood, with his innocent suffering and death on the cross, He purchased and won us us, that we may be his own and that we may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This Jesus is the historic and living Christ. When we confess Christ, we confess a Christ that died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We confess Christ and him crucified and resurrected for sinners like me and like you too. Take comfort, dear baptized saints. It was necessary for the Christ to die. This was the plan and Jesus carried it out. It was necessary that he suffer and he die and be raised for you and me, for our idolatry, for our past sins, for our present sins, for our future sins. It was necessary for him to suffer. It was necessary for him to die and be raised for our forgiveness so that we might clothe, so that he might clothe you and me in righteousness and declare us his own for all eternity, Christ. Now that we have laid forth what we mean and do not mean by the word Christ, it is crucial that the word alone be examined as well. The word alone, my friends, in this day and age is a very controversial word. The word alone indicates that something is confined to a specific subject or thing or person. It is a word that is used to emphasize that only one factor out of several is being considered. It is a word that emphasizes that one thing is greater or better or more unique than other things around it. In other words, the word alone puts a period after the word Christ, not a comma. It creates exclusivity. Otherwise stated, the great scandal of the Reformation was not only the exposure of a false Christ, 
a false Christ who demanded indulgences and works righteousness for salvation, but it was also the exclusive particle alone that caused offense as well. The word alone has always caused offense from the Apostle Paul to the Lutherans of the 16th century and to today in the 21st century. With that stated, as Christians, I believe it is possible to arrive at a solid and biblical confession of who Christ is. However, once Christ is confessed, there will indeed be a great divide among Christians on whether or not a period or a comma will be inserted after Christ. In other words, the idea of Christ with a period is offensive to our modern sensibilities because it, it undercuts this role and our narcissistic inclinations. On the other hand, a comma, a simple comma after Jesus Christ, after Christ, it allows us to be involved in our spirituality, even if it is 1% involvement. The reality is that we desire to adhere to this comma theology because our sinful nature is so inclined to add to Jesus. Our flesh, the sinful Adam that we have, loves the idea of the comma and cannot stand the idea of a Jesus with a period. We want to add a comma so that we can allow for our will and our abilities to have a subtle yet prominent role in our spirituality. Tragically, though, it has been rightly stated before that Jesus plus something equals nothing and a Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That is to say, it is that comma or that small addition to Christ, the negating of the word alone, that causes the most problems. Think about this for a moment. How we subtly negate the word alone and add to Jesus Jesus plus our Christian living, Jesus plus our decision, Jesus plus our obedience, Jesus plus our repentance, Jesus plus our response, our devotion, our prayers, our good works as evidence of our salvation. What are the implications of having a comma after Jesus, even if it only constitutes 1%? The harsh reality is that any time that we add to Jesus, we end up subtracting from him and his work on the cross. A spirituality of 0.00001% works righteousness is still works righteousness and may open the door to Christian apostasy. More specifically, let us take a brief moment to look closer at two types of comma theology that are present in our day that negate the period. Two theologies that disregard the aloneness of Christ and attempt to add that comma to Christ. The first is what I like to call pre-gospel legalism. Pre-gospel legalism occurs when one imposes requirements, hoops, and duties as prerequisites that are needed to be earned, obtained, or acquired so that one may receive Christ's forgiveness and acceptance. Prerequisites such as a person needs to reach a certain moral standard of perfection and rid himself of certain moral virtues or vices in order to obtain forgiveness. Or a person needs to do good Christian deeds in order to exchange these deeds for forgiveness. A person maybe needs to give a certain amount of money, a monetary amount, to prove his worthiness and devotion in order to be admitted to the kingdom of God. Pre-gospel legalism It occurs for the purpose of mankind acquiring salvation, which leads to a man-centered theology. Pre-gospel legalism removes the period from Christ and adds a comma and demands human requirements for acquiring salvation, which results not in a Christ with a period, but a Christ with a comma. In pre-gospel legalism, mankind's legalistic agendas exist before the preconditions are prerequisites for reception of Christ and his gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. The other one is this. The second type of comma theology is what I like to call post-gospel legalism. Post-gospel legalism happens when one codifies the response to the gospel by prescribing what the response to the gospel should mean when it should happen, how it should happen, how it should be done, and how, out, how often it should happen 
and where it should happen, so as to legitimize God's forgiveness and acceptance in Christ. Codified responses such as this, a person, a real person of Christ, needs to pray five times a day at a specific time with a specific formula to validate that he is really a committed believer. A person needs to do family devotions in a specified manner from a specific book to be a true family man of God. A person needs to evangelize to three people per day in a certain evangelism technique in order to show that they are on, on fire disciple of Jesus. You see, post-gospel legalism it occurs for the purpose of mankind legitimizing salvation, which leads to a man-centered theology. Post-gospel legalism, yes, post-gospel legalism removes the period from Christ and then attaches human conditions for leg legitimizing salvation, which results with Christ with a comma. What makes both pre-gospel legalism and post-gospel legalism so tragic and so toxic is that they both bury Christ. They attempt to shove Christ back into the tomb, for they do not use Christ as the mediator for sinners. These comma ideologies, they imagine that by their own fulfillment of prerequisites and by their own fulfillment of conditions of the law, that forgiveness of sins is received and, yes, maintained. This poisonous comma theology is an invention of the old Adam and is enacted by idle people who have no idea how the forgiveness of sins takes place. This comma ideology does not realize that by adding to Christ, one is actually negating Christ's atonement. Simply stated, when we use a comma after Christ, Christ is only going to be as good as our addition is. In other words, how will we ever know if our Christian living, our decisions, our religious endeavoring, obedience, repentance, prayer, devotions, and good works are good enough? We will always be vulnerable to doubt, and we will always lack assurance when we use a comma rather than a period. Have we been obedient enough? Have we made a good enough salvation decision and is it binding? Will it stick? Have we prayed enough and done enough good works? Have we sincerely repented and actually truly meant it? Anytime mankind takes credit for acquiring and legitimizing salvation, the emphasis is taken off of Christ's atonement and placed on mankind. The accent mark is moved off of Christ and doubt happens. My friends, it is Christ and solely Christ that acquires and legitimizes salvation for you and for me. Anything less waters down or confuses the message of the gospel and strips away assurance. The good news, the good news for you and for me is that this Christian life is a period kind of spirituality. The reformers of the 16th century knew this and they fought for this against the synergistic and Pelagian spiritual climate of the day. They fought against basically man-centered theology, those that would want to place a comma after Christ. That is the reason why we receive these blessed solas from them, the word alone, Christ alone, grace alone, all alone. Baptized saints... Hear this today, nowhere in Scripture is Jesus spoken of as the starting point, the beginning, but now you must add to him or move beyond him. Salvation in Jesus does not have a comma, which means that he cannot, that we cannot attach anything to him. He is not some launching pad for greater and better euphoric, mystical experiences. Christ is not a baseball, ba baseball base that we round to come back to home. Jesus is not incomplete, and he is not a means to another end. Jesus is not a means to the end goal of joy and hope and glory. No, my friends, he is the end. Jesus is your hope, he is your joy, and he is your glory. He is the Alpha and the Omega. You do not move beyond Jesus. Jesus is the beginning and the end. No comma, no dash, no, col no colon, Jesus with a period. Indeed, you and I are saved by Christ completely, 
and we are sustained by Christ completely, and we grow into Christ. No comma is needed. In fact, we progress in this Christian faith when we move away from our pride of ourselves and, we, and our own understandings of our achievements to a gradual awareness of our own spiritual fa- failure and Christ's work in us as we entrust ourselves to him. We move away from the conviction that we are self-sufficient to the repeated experience of spiritual bankruptcy. We move on from our delusions of spiritual importance to a growing sense of our utter insignificance and the glory of God. We move on from delight in our own power to the painful recognition of our spiritual weaknesses. We are brought from our self-righteousness to the increasing consciousness that we are sinful. Indeed, in our human lives, growing up involves a gradual shift from dependence to independence, but the reverse is true for us when we grow spiritually. On our journey, we become more and more dependent upon Christ for everything in every situation. We do not then proceed from childhood to adulthood. We, excuse me, we do not then proceed from childhood to adulthood. We move forward into spiritual childhood as we as we grow in faith, and become people of prayer. It is Christ with a period, not a comma. Christ for all. My friends, our confession is Christ and Christ alone, and here we stand. We can confess nothing else. Christ and him alone is the center of our theology. Certainly we Christians are Christocentric. Now regarding this great Christocentric confession, though, there's one more loose end, and I ask for your patience as we tie up one loose, loose end here. We need to address, and it is this, who is running the verbs? In Christianity. In other words, it is quite possible to have a correct definition and confession of Christ and Him alone and to have Him at the center of our theology, but to do so in a way that Christ becomes the recipient of our verbs and our actions to Him rather than you and I being the recipient of Christ doing the verbs to and through and for us. Permit me to explain. The blessed Norman Nagel loves to say this, it is all about who is running the verbs. If the Christian runs the verbs in Christianity, it is a dead end. Only if Christ runs the verbs does it lead somewhere. Otherwise stated, in our modern Western civilization, we are a culture that likes to do things. We are neither comfortable nor familiar with being acted upon. Even computer word processing Um, machines uh, uh, such as Microsoft Word, they flag verbs when when they are in the passive voice as improper English. That stated, it is urgent that we guard against the temptation to take control of these verbs, which would result in the sheep serving the shepherd, the clay forming the potter, and the branch producing fruit for the vine, and the sinner saving the Savior. This is an inversion As subtle as it is, it results in undercutting everything about solus Christus. To have Christ and him alone as the center of our theology is indeed necessary, but it must also be understood in a way that Christ is the one running the verbs. He is the subject. We are the direct objects. He did and does the divine verbs to and for us. Christ is for you and for me. Finally, to uphold Christ alone as the center of our theology, it must be asked, what verbs does Christ do? If any of the false Christs are to sneak back into our theology at this point, the verbs would sound like this, cheering and modeling and psychologizing and so forth. No, may this never be. It is Christ crucified alone for sinners, sinners like me and you. It may never be. We need a Christ crucified alone for sinners, a Christ that suffers, bleeds, dies, and resurrects for you and for me. The Lord, he runs the verbs. That way they are reliable. To have us run them, we begin to wobble. All verbs of salvation are in the passive, the divine passive. Think about that. The Lord, he justifies you. The Lord redeems you. The Lord sanctifies you. The Lord 
forgives you. The Lord illuminates you, regenerates you, converts you. The Lord claims you. He adopts you, and he baptizes you. Amen. Amen indeed. In conclusion, we have heard about Christ. We've heard about Christ alone. We've heard about Christ running the verbs. This is Christ crucified alone for you and for me. This solid understanding of Christ's person and work on our behalf is the central message of the scriptures and at the heart of the Reformation and at the heart of our theology today. However, the attacks on Solus Christus will continue as they have in the past. Yes, the person and work of Christ will continue to be attacked and the aloneness of Christ will be attacked as well. In spite of this, in spite of this, the Lutheran Church of the Reformation confesses boldly and confidently Christ alone and him crucified. From the pulpit, the podium, the bedside, the desk, Christ's holy bride, the church, and her pastors preach Christ crucified. When people come looking for marital advice, it is Christ crucified. When people come looking for sympathy in a listening ear, it is Christ crucified. When a new baby is born, when jobs are lost, when fear of retirement sets in, when parents die, and when the shadow of death encroaches, it is Christ crucified. It is all about Jesus dying and rising. No matter the circumstances, what the situation, it is Christ crucified alone for me and for you and for our world. Solus Christus. Amen.